Have you ever wondered why we give calcium gluconate to patients with hyperkalemia, high serum potassium? Spoiler alert, the traditional explanation might not be accurate. Today, we're diving deep into how hyperkalemia affects the heart, why calcium gluconate helps, and importantly, why our understanding of calcium's role just get turned upside down. Before we jump into hyperkalemia, let's quickly refresh how a normal action potential works in cardiac cells. It all starts at resting membrane potential. Resting membrane potential is the baseline electrical charge difference across the cardiomyocyte membrane, typically about minus 90 millivolts. It is maintained mainly by potassium ions and is the starting point before any electrical impulse or action potential occurs. An action potential fires when the membrane potential reaches a specific threshold, rising from the baseline of minus 90 millivolts to around minus 70 millivolts. This is known as the threshold potential. Once the threshold potential is reached, it is causing sodium channels to rapidly open. The distance between the resting membrane potential and threshold potential determines the excitability of the cell. The sudden rush of sodium ions into the cell causes rapid depolarization, marking phase zero. Afterward, the cell goes through phases of brief repolarization, phase one, plateau, phase two, driven by calcium influx, and finally, repolarization, phase three, with potassium leaving the cell, returning back to the resting potential in phase four. What if your patient has a high plasma potassium level known as hyperkalemia? When extracellular potassium goes up, say above 5.5 millimoles per liter, it begins to elevate resting membrane potential. Why does it happen? This happens because the gradient for potassium across the cell membrane becomes smaller. So fewer potassium ions exit the cell. And since potassium ions are positively charged, their accumulation inside the cell makes the resting membrane potential more positive. As the resting membrane potential becomes more positive, this can actually slightly speed up conduction by moving resting membrane potential closer to threshold potential, making the cells more excitable. But here is the catch. At higher potassium levels, typically above eight millimoles per liter, the elevated resting membrane potential inactivates sodium channels. And this is because sodium channels require the membrane to return to a more negative potential to reset from inactivation to a ready to fire state. When the resting membrane potential stays elevated due to hyperkalemia, sodium channels can't reset. So they're unavailable for activation. This situation reduces sodium influx slows conduction velocity dramatically, widens QRS complexes on ECG, and if severe enough, creates a life-threatening sine wave ECG pattern. So as you can see, hyperkalemia may lead to this biphasic response where mild to moderate elevations of serum potassium in the range of 5.5 to 6.5 millimoles per liter may initially speed up conduction slightly, 
and lead to tachycardia instead of classic bradycardia that we expect to see in hyperkalemic patients. However, more severe hyperkalemia above 7 to 8 millimoles per liter drastically slows conduction, causing widened QRS intervals and severe cases can produce life-threatening sine wave ECG patterns, conduction block, and cardiac arrest. Clinically, watch out for these ECG red flags indicating severe hyperkalemia. Widened QRS complexes, loss of P waves, development of the sine wave pattern. If you see these ECG changes, it's a direct indication to give calcium gluconate as soon as possible. This sets up a perfect segue into discussing why we administer calcium to patients with hyperkalemia. Traditionally, we've explained the benefits of calcium gluconate administration in this population of patients by saying it stabilizes the cardiac membrane. This membrane stabilization theory proposed that calcium administration either raises the threshold potential by enhancing sodium channel function, increasing the gap between resting and threshold potential, which reduces cell excitability. Another alternative is that calcium somehow returns resting membrane potential to its more negative state. And both of these theories could explain the membrane stabilization effect. But here's where it gets interesting. New research challenges this idea. A recent study by Bichtel and colleagues used canine cardiac cells and wedge preparations to test exactly what's going on when we give calcium during severe hyperkalemia. They found something surprising. Calcium gluconate did not restore the elevated resting membrane potential and it did not affect fat sodium channels, meaning it had no effect on threshold potential either. Instead, the researchers found calcium administration restored conduction through an entirely different mechanism. Calcium dependent conduction by L type calcium channels. In severe hyperkalemia, sodium channels close due to the elevated resting membrane potential, making conduction extremely slow, as we discussed earlier. Calcium gluconate bypasses the sodium channel block by opening L-type calcium channels and enhancing the calcium current, allowing the electrical impulse pass from cell to cell, restoring conduction speed despite high potassium. The researchers even specifically tested the traditional theory by blocking sodium channels with tetraductoxin. And they found that blocking sodium channels didn't change calcium's beneficial effect. This confirms Calcium's positive effects weren't from improving sodium channel function. Let's use a traffic jam analogy to make this complex topic easier to understand. Imagine you are on a highway where cars representing electrical signals in the heart are trying to move forward. Normally, fast moving lanes, i.e. sodium channels, let traffic zip through at high speed, keeping everything running smoothly. But suddenly, a major accident, i.e. severe hyperkalemia, happens up ahead. The normal lanes get completely blocked and no cars can move forward. Traffic slows to a crawl, creating a massive jam. Just like how conduction in the heart slows when sodium channels become inactivated due to hyperkalemia. Now, here's where calcium gluconate comes in. Instead of clearing the blockage 
In other words, fixing sodium channels, it opens up a new emergency lane, L-type calcium channels on the side of the road. Ambulances and emergency vehicles, i.e. electrical signals, can now bypass the blockage and keep moving, even though the original lanes, i.e. sodium channels, are still closed. So, calcium gluconate doesn't fix the original traffic jam, sodium channel. It just creates a new way for signals to get through, allowing the heart to keep beating properly despite severe hyperkalemia. So, why this new understanding matters? Clinically, this justifies why calcium gluconate rapidly normalizes ECG abnormalities despite no change in resting membrane potential. The take-home message is clear. Calcium gluconate works not by fixing sodium channel function or stabilizing the membrane, but by establishing an alternative conduction pathway through calcium-dependent mechanisms. For those interested in digging deeper in potassium supplementation, remember to check out our free intravenous potassium supplementation course. The link can be found in the description below. And if you found this deep dive into hyperkalemia helpful, drop a comment below and let me know your thoughts. Also, I need your help choosing the next research paper we'll cover. Drop a comment below to vote for one of the papers displayed on the screen. And I'll see you in the next video. Take care, everyone.